thanks for having me. My name is Shayan. And this talk has got a bit of a different spirit to it. Hello. Uh, because it's not, strictly speaking, IoT related. It's more of a uh, medical device related talk. And I hope it's going to be of interest to you. Um, I'm going to be going through some slides and then hopefully any questions I can answer. Or if I can answer, I'll be, do, I'll be doing that after the talk. So let's start. So my talk is going to be about a structured light polythymography. And that's the name of the technology that we have in Numaker. Uh, my name, as I said, is Dr. Shayan Motamidi, and Numaker is a company I come from. It's a Cambridge-based company and has been around for some time. Uh, brief overview. So I'm going to give just a very brief history of Numaker and what it's been doing, what it's doing now. And talk about basically Numica is a res respiratory uh, company. So the pioneers in re developing non-contact respiratory measurement. Then I'm going to talk about how basically your traditional lung function or respiratory function is measured and how, you know, the, if there are problems with that, if there, you know, can we find an alternative to that? And then how polythymography, uh, which essentially will look at some examples and then go into structured life with thermography and see if that can help the problem. And then just uh, having been in the medical device industry for a couple of years now, I've come across some of the challenges, which hopefully I can briefly talk about. So, Numacare. Numacare started as a Cambridge University spin-off in 2009. Uh, as I said, pioneering development of non-contact respiratory measurement. Uh, it was the first company to receive funding from University of Cambridge Discovery Fund, secured Medical Futures Innovation Award in 2011 in the respiratory category. Uh, recently, so one year ago, we got the FDA. FDA is the Food and Drug Administration in the US. Basically, any drugs or any medical device, if you want to sell it in the US, you have to have at least a 510k clearance. So we got that 510k clearance for measuring respiratory rate in March 2016. Uh, we've also been working on uh, publications basically trying to prove the clinical utility of our device and publications and journal publications have been coming out since 2016 and 2017 and basically we are we are working on sort of different fronts the, more on the research side and then on the sales side and that's 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 where we are now so moving forward um, respiratory measurement how is your respiratory function is being measured at the moment uh, so so how, how is it measured? How is your traditional lung function is measured? So you say, you know, you, you have a problem, you 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 cough a lot, you feel breathless, uh, you, you, you feel there is something wrong with your res respiratory system. So you go to your doctor, your doctor may refer you to go and see hospital. Somewhere down the line, you will basically be asked to have a PF LFT test, which stands for pulmonary uh, function test or a lung function test. Uh, which is a battery of tests so it's, it's, you know it's got it's got you know you've got a couple of different tests which you do but at the core of it you have what's called an aspirometry so it, 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 as you can see in the picture it's basically a handheld device it's a spirometer you have to inhale or inspire maximally and then exhale maximally and then that will the device will measure your respiration your your forced expiration and then measure some parameters, and from that basically drives your uh, lung function. So is your lung healthy? Yes or no, depends on the parameters. Um, what you actually need to do for a spirometry, a spirometry is you need to perform the test at least three times, and you need to, the, the tolerance on the test needs to be within 5% of one another. So if that isn't the case, you have to repeat until you get three measurements, which are within 5% of each other. And that, that can be difficult because some people, in itself, if you sort of try to sort of maximally inspire and expire, it's, it's a difficult task to do. And then you have to do it a couple of times. And, and that's how you get your spirometry. Some parameters, which I've, I've mentioned two, which are probably most frequently used than others, is the forced expiratory volume in one second. That's how much air you can, you can push out of your lungs in one second, essentially, and forced vital capacity. That's your entire lung capacity and for example if your fev1 divided by fvc ratio is less than 70 percent then you might have some sort of obstructive 
respiratory disease. Or there are many more parameters, but again, that's, that's just to give you an example. A lot of the information which comes out of a spirometry is actually coming out of what's called a flow volume loop. So on the left, you've got you've got you've got a loop which is basically called a flow volume loop. On the top side, you have the expiratory part of the loop, and the bottom side you have inspiratory part of the loop. The x-axis is volume in liters, and the y-axis is the flow. And flow is basically liter per second. So if you differentiate volume, you get flow. And if you integrate flow, you get volume. And you can see that the peak expiratory, so PEF peak expiratory flow, and other parameters like uh, forced expiratory flow at 25%, 50%, 75%, same with forced inspiratory flow at, var at various different stages. And all of these parameters basically tend to quantify the shape of this flow volume loop and then get information from it. Now, what are the potential problems? First, I mean, the spirometry is, is great because so many people have used it. So you've got hundreds of thousands of data sets which you, which you can call upon and basically you, you can have for every agenda, every different age, every BMI, you can have some sort of normal reference value. So that's great. Um, however, as mentioned before, it's not, it's not the easiest test. So it, it, it's not super well tolerated. And you actually, to perform it, you need highly trained specialists to, to be able to actually coach the person through spirometry. So it's not very easy to perform. Uh, it cannot be done in children. So in young children, less than six-year-old, you, you cannot, they, they, can't, they cannot do spirometry. And if you are mentally challenged or if you are elderly, uh, you, you probably can't do spirometry. And there are some other sort of diseases or pathophysiologies in which you can't do spirometry. And some of the examples I've mentioned, if, if you're if, if you have a stroke patient, um, that you can't you can't put the spirometry or the mouthpiece because they can't grip it. And if you have a neuromuscular disease, your muscles are quite weak. So you can't again measure them, measure their lung function with the spirometric. So all of this to basically say that there's a clear need for something to measure lung function for people who can't do spirometry. So what is tidal breathing? And is tidal breathing the alternative we're looking for? Tidal breathing is your, is your normal, quiet, natural breathing. So as, you know, as you're sitting, listening to this talk, you're breathing. That's what I refer to as your tidal breathing or your quiet, quiet, quiet breathing. Um, it doesn't require any force maneuver. It's this natural background of breathing. And it can be quite variable, and that's one of the problems which has historically been referred to so part of breathing is very variable how can we rely on that and naturally it's it's not a spirometry there is no force maneuver involved so the parameters which we look at in tidal breathing are quite different to what we look at in force maneuvers so what what are these parameters so on the top left uh, at, at the top left you, you you get to see the a trace now that trace corresponds to a single breath that's one respiratory cycle it could be volume, it could be movement, but that's, you know, the, the pattern of it is the pattern of a single breath. Uh, from the peak to the, from the trough to the peak, you have your inspiratory time. And then from the peak to the valley or the trough, you have your expiratory time. The entire time that it takes for you to do one breath is your total breath time, which then relates to your respiratory rate. If you differentiate this, you get this, which is your flow or your rate of displacement. And then from this, you can calculate some other parameters which relate to flow, essentially. So you can measure the time that it takes for you to reach your peak tidal expiratory flow or the time that it takes for you to reach the peak tidal expiratory flow. And much like the flow volume loop that we saw in this parametry section, we have another thing which looks very similar. So you have the spirit. It's a flow volume loop, but it's a tidal flow volume loop. So it's not derived from a force maneuver. It's, it's when it's... It's when it's measured when you're when you're doing tidal breathing, and then again, similar to spirometry, you have various different parameters which quantify the shape of this flow volume. Um, another thing which can be measured during tidal which can potentially be measured during tidal breathing is not only the temporal side of things. So the temporal, I mean, time related. So all the parameters we saw earlier, these are time time related. So we have spirometry. Inspiratory time, you have time to pick a spiritual flow. 
but we can also have a spatial parameter. So these are when, say, looking at the surface of your chest and abdomen, and we look at different compartments. Compartments can be the chest or thorax and the abdomen, for example. And then you want to see how much each compartment is contributing towards the whole breathing force. And that's what I've displayed in the top figure. So if, if the, again, one respiratory cycle. Uh, if, the, if the larger one is the movement or the volume displaced by the entire thoracoabdominal wall or your chest and abdomen, and then you've got two types, well, a sm smaller one, one corresponding to the ribcage, one corresponding to the abdomen. Simply by dividing the magnitude of those, you can you can have an estimate of how much each compartment is contributing towards your breathing. And another thing which becomes quite important in tidal breathing or spatial information or regional information, in tidal breathing is phase or asynchrony, or technically speaking, thoracodominal asynchrony. That is basically saying, is, is your chest and abdomen, are they moving together? So if your chest moves up and your abdomen moves up, and then they go back down together. That's okay. That's that's normal. That's what tends to happen as, as we breathe. But what happens if it's not the case? What happens if they're going out of phase? So what happens if my chest is coming up and my abdomen is actually going inside or the other way around? And this this is another sort of piece of vital information you can get out of tyler breathing. And the graph, what it shows you is basically at the middle, if your ribcage and abdomen are exactly on top of each other, there is no phase difference. So if you plot the rib cage against abdomen, you essentially get a straight line. If, however, there is a bit of a difference between them, like the one here or the one here, you can see that the plot of rib cage against abdomen starts to become circular. And if there is a large phase difference between them, it's, it's going to be a complete circle. So plotting, again, the rib cage signal against the abdominal signal can give you an indication of how in phase or out of phase they're moving. And, the, and this thoracobdominal asynchrony then becomes important in some of the pathophysiologies and it becomes a marker, a tidal breathing marker. Now, where does polythismography come into this or what is polythismography in the first place for some of you who may not be very familiar with this? So any instrument which measures a change in volume of an organ or the whole body is, an, is a polythismograph. Uh, for breathing or respiratory quantification or respiratory measurement, um, I can mention three, which are three polythymographs plethysmo which can be used to actually measure tidal breathing. So the first one is respiratory inductance polythysmography, or RIP, or RIP. Sometimes you we, we refer to them as recipe bands or RIP bands as well, so that's, that's what they are. There is optoelectronic polythysmography, or OEP. And there's a structured light prosthesmography, which is the technology we use at Numica. I'm going to briefly go through each one to just give you a brief understanding of what each one is and what each one does. So recipe bands. Essentially, um, simple, um, fairly old, I think about 50 years. They've been around, probably more. Um, you, you've got essentially two transducer bands. You put one around the chest, you put another one around the abdomen. And that transduces essentially response to the excursions of the body. So if when the body moves, uh, the, the bands essentially elasticate. So they, they would sort of extend and shrink. And then those generate proportional voltages. And then you, you measure that voltage, you'll, you'll have a respiratory pattern in essence. Um, it's it's a good it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a good device. You you can clinically and in, in clinic have, it, it's been used in sleep studies. So in long hours, nine hours, overnight studies, you can actually use rib bands to measure uh, respiratory or abdominal and thoracic respiratory patterns. Can estimate volume. So that is if if you calibrate it with a flow meter, you can potentially estimate volume, and it's fairly low cost. So it's affordable. It's cheap. However, having had used the device, I would say it's a little bit flimsy to use, or at least the version that I use is a disposable bands, and they tend to slip, and it's the, the pattern of the breathing basically changes depending on how tight or how well positioned the bands are. So it's, it's a little bit, I would say, flimsy to use, and it requires contact with the patient. Um, this is the original work which Kimio Kono, Kono and Jerry Mead have done in. 1967 and 
that's that's where the idea comes from. So essentially, you've got a person breathing, and then you've got a thread connected to a pulley, and then connected to a transducer on abdomen, and then you've got another one for abdomen, another one for thorax. And basically, any movement uh, of the chest and abdomen will be translated into a change on the transducer, which you can then measure using amplifiers and basically this XY recorder. And that XY recorder is exactly the, the thing we talked about earlier. It's the plot of chest versus abdomen. It's actually referred to as a Kona and Mead plot. So based on the work of these guys, it's, it's called it, it, plot of chest movement versus abdominal movement is, a, is referred to as a Kona and Mead plot. And that's where it comes from. Um, moving forward, OEP, optoelectronic pathomography. Now, this is quite interesting because it's actually quite similar to, to the technology that we have, structural pathomography, pathomography. It's been around for some time. And what it does is it basically uses reflective markers and very carefully position them on the body, and that goes around the body and then uses four cameras or more, which are sort of positioned around the person, to, to look at these re reflective markers and basically track them over time to generate a 3D surface of the body and then essentially calculate volume and calculate breathing patterns from it. Uh, the technology is basically your motion capture. So your Hollywood blockbusters have been using it for some time. Games are starting to use it, and many of them actually do use it. To give you a sort of more natural movement and it's the same sort of principle you, you put the markers you you measure the person you just essentially put physiological markers so you know where they are so that enables you to estimate volume subsequently and you you, you you track the movement over time and you build up your 3d surface and you build up your breathing pattern from that um on the Top left, you've got probably something, you know, it looks like a prototype device. You've got the cameras, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six cameras there. And at the middle, you've got something which looks like a cradle. So I'm guessing that's probably to measure infants or newborns or, or, or babies. On the bottom, you've got what seems like a, a vision of what, the, what this device sort of could be. So it's uh, actually very neatly designed. You've got all the cameras and the station, which you then read the data and the markers and the estimation of volume. And what I can say about the device is actually is, is very uh, well appreciated in research. It can calculate volume. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big advantage of it and can be used during exercise. However, it's rather costly and its setup is quite time consuming and it still needs placement of physical marker on the body. Uh, which is, you know, it's mostly non-contact, but you still have to put the markers. Now, this would bring me into SLP, Structured Light Prothermography. Uh, in SLP, it's, it's, as I said, very similar to OEP. However, we've changed the reflective markers with actually built virtual markers. So the, this is essentially, we project a, a structured pattern of light, which in our case is a um, checkerboard. And then every intersection point on that checkerboard can be tracked and tracked with two cameras. And basically, you can get a movement over time trace by, by tracking those points over time. Uh, bottom left and right, you've got the actual devices. So that's a full size device. And on the right, you have a compact device. And at the middle, you've got the principle of how SLP works. So your subject can be seated or actually can be supine, as in lying down. You project the pattern on the chest and abdomen. You ask them to put the cross point on the zip sternum, that's the bottom of the breastbone. And this provides for repeatability of the data set. So basically, if you measure them again or measure someone else, your, your data set can, can be considered sort of repeatable or comparable. And then if you look at the movement across the whole sort of surface of intersection points and average it and look at the movement of that average surface you tend to get what's at the bottom of the screen which is a which is a pattern which is a one-dimensional pattern of breathing essentially what happens in the scanning head is is this is a sort of very uh, simple view of it you have a projector it's a normal projector that you use you know it's for you know the one you used to watch TVs or whatever, so it's uh, no radiation, it's white light. 
and then you've got two cameras which sort of independently look at the same area. Um, essentially, you have the checkerboard, you, you shine it on the body, and then image the grid, basically your chest and abdomen, with two carefully positioned video cameras. Extract 2D image positions of the grid points. So e each camera basically see it, sees a 2D image. You can extract the, you can detect the intersection points and you can get the uh, coordinates of those points. And then finally, you can use a stereo vision to reconstruct 3D position of each intersection point in a space and time. Now, when you can do that, you can actually reconstruct the whole surface as a you reconstruct a 3D surface. And then because you have access to every point in every um, in time and the space, you can actually have a moving surface going forwards and backwards, and then you can generate a trace from that movement. So in, in our case, basically average actual displacement of the entire thoracic abdominal wall will, will generate that trace for you. Now, this is, um, I thought this might be quite interesting. This is a one of the sort of earlier prototypes that we had, and this basically shows how a structured light lithography work, works in practice or one of the earlier design of it. So I've tried to play that. I, I know there is a, you know, if you're watching it on the internet, so it might not be as smooth as I see it here, but hopefully it's not going to be too bad. Yep, start it. So that's basically two breath or two respiratory cycle. That's the first one, a shallow breath, followed by a deeper one. You can see the sort of chest and abdomen inflating and then completely deflating. You can almost see the creases on the T-shirt sort of being detected on the surface. I'm moving on, and obviously we've been working on this and all of that work has led into sort of us being able to develop a piece of software which can actually give us uh, all the things that we want from such a device to, to measure various type of breathing parameters. So that's just a snapshot of the software that we have. On the top right, top, uh, top left, you have the reconstructed 3D surface. On the right, you've got the movement over time, trace essentially. And you can, for example, see that uh, you have a blue trace, you have a green trace. The blue trace corresponds to the movement of abdomen. The green trace corresponds to the movement of chest. You have the Kona and Mead plot on the bottom left. That's the plot of um, chest movement versus abdominal movement. And what, what we talked about earlier about the phase, this looks you know, more, like, more like a straight line, so they probably are moving in phase. Um, and this is the, or the surrogate flow volume loop that we use. So it's the tidal breathing flow volume loop in the bottom right. And what I thought would be interesting was to show you the actual software. I sort of go through and I'm going to show you just a couple of examples. I'm going to run the software and show it to you. Excellent. So what I've done is I've already loaded a, a, a healthy subject there. So that's a 32-year-old female. You can see the reconstructed 3D surface. What you can do, you can actually replay this and have a look at the movement. Now, hopefully, you see what I see, which is a sort of smooth surface moving backwards and forwards together. And it's very useful to have this feature because if there are any sort of artifacts on the data, you'll be able to see it under 3D reconstruction. If the 3D reconstruction is not moving as smoothly as you want it, or if there are parts missing, that means the tracker has failed to identify the intersection more correctly, so you can actually see that, which is very useful. Also, if the breathing pattern that you're looking for is, is, a, is you're looking for a particular pattern, uh, you can always actually replay it and look at the movement of the chest and abdomen because that will give you a better idea of what the underlying issue might be. Uh, you can zoom in on different sections and look, look at the respiratory pattern. What it does, it also zooms in on the subsequent figures that you have underneath. So these two respiratory cycles correspond to the Kona and me plot of the blue curves here and correspond to these two uh, flow volume loops, tidal breathing flow volume loops. You can reset the graph or zoom in in a different place. You can look at chest versus abdomen. Again, 
just by looking at the you can you can see immediately that the peak to peak amplitude of your uh, abdominal movement is is higher than your the movement of the chest and if you go to the tidal tap tidal breathing tap you actually have numeric values for this so this is respiratory rate 21 breath per minute you have inspiratory time you have expiratory time you have the contribution of chest to abdomen we talked about. So, you know, we can visibly see that one is larger than the other, and you can actually numerically quantify that here as 59%, 41%. And IE50, which is a measure of the shape of this flow volume loop at the, at the midpoint, the 50%. It's also possible to sort of, because you have a grid and you can, you can look at, essentially, you can look at every single intersection point but you can also divide it into sort of general compartments or general sections. So you can look at left versus right. Now, usually you wouldn't expect a difference between left versus right. This becomes particularly important if you've had, say, a thoracic surgery. So if you had, for example, a part of your lung removed, then you can measure the patient before or immediately after and during follow-up. And that will actually show you, and we've got sort of, we've got a publication in this, that how we can actually track the recovery of the patient through movement of chest and abdomen. So that that particular left versus right feature, which uh, I think apart from OEP, no other device sort of offers that left versus right um, division can be useful in that regard. Incrementally, you could go further down. You could look at quadrant, which is left and right hemithorax, and then divide the abdominal part into two regions. And, also possible to look at a custom region. So say I'm interested in the movement of diaphragm. What I can do, I can select that particular region. Okay, there we go. So you can select a custom region and look at the movement of that compared to the rest, rest, rest of the thoracic abdominal wall. Uh, now this is, as I said, this is a this is a healthy subject. Now I've, I've got another one sort of ready here, which is of a child with uh, acute asthma. So this is a six-year-old male with acute asthma. You can see the grid. So the first things are the grid size has changed. This is a different grid size. Obviously, it's a child, so you need to be able to accommodate for that or account for that. And you can see the cono and meat plot is completely different. Your flow volume loop looks a bit different, but you need to really zoom in see that but what's really strikingly different comparing this patient to the other one is what's called a paradoxical breathing so you can see in the here your thoracic region is going up your abdominal region is coming down so these are completely paradoxical breathing or paradoxical movement and then you can also reconfirm that looking at the cono and meat plot you can also get an indication of the numerical value for that. So it's 95 degrees is the, is the phase, is the breath phase. And usually anything less than 10 is normal. Anything more than 10 is considered to be abnormal. So again, this is just how um, quickly you can have a look at a data set and you can, you can interrogate it to get some useful information about the inner working of the lungs. So back to the slides. But to summarize, um, SLP, SLP is completely non-contact. So I think that's one of its main advantages. It's, it's very easy to tolerate and it's very actually easy to use it. So performance wise, it's the operator doesn't need a lot of training to be able to use the device. It's portable and it can be used in a variety of different populations and in sort of rare diseases, which, which, which makes it really accessible. On the other hand, it's also it's it's not very cheap, so it's a moderate to high cost. It does not measure, strictly speaking, it does not measure volume at the moment. So it, it can be it can be made to measure volume, but that needs further development. And it cannot be used during the exercise. It can be used before and after, but it can't be used during the exercise because it's sensitive to movement. So any movement that you have, which is not respiratory related, will also be recorded. So ideally, you want the patient or subject to be sort of sitting still, not moving about too much. And that basically brings me to the final slide. So I'm going to be very brief here. Uh, there are many challenges in the medical device industries, and especially being a new medical device, you have you basically have experts who have used traditional methods for very many years. So it's actually very difficult to um, 
get past that. It's almost like an invisible barrier, which you, you have to really try to get past it. And what the way to do it is basically through validation, 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 and then research, which, which helps that. So you need to be able to prove the clinical utility of the drug. And that comes through, you know, your what you can do to research or what independent groups do with your device um, in, in terms of research just to show what it can be used for or how uh, it can basically benefit patients. Um, another thing is, you know, we, we are living in an age which, you know, there is a lot of talk about machine learning. There are very powerful techniques, deep learning, and, you, you know, th these these fabulous techniques can, can be applied to things to uncover a lot of a lot of the things that we don't know. However, coming from, again, medical device perspective on this would be you actually, for, for a lot of these techniques, you actually need a lot of data. And gathering that data is really not very easy because it's, it's you know, you have to obviously have ethics to collect, you know, to, to have patients to collect data you need to have. Um, it's, it's very costly. It's very time consuming. So what you, and, you know, in, in many of the diseases, you just don't have enough patients. So you, you simply cannot have many patients who have a certain type of surgery in a certain hospital. So it's in some, in certain areas, there is just not possible to get many subjects. So in, in that sort of, we, we basically tend to rely on good old statistical methods. And finally, the, the regulations around medical devices is, you know, very much like drugs is, is very tight. So from start to finish, everything needs to be sort of validated and documented to certain standards. Your software needs to be uh, done to to sort of a certain standard on software for medical devices. Your measurements and everything needs to be, devices need to be obviously calibrated. Everything need, that you measure needs to be traceable to a national standard. And then, you know, you've got different regulations in different areas, which, which also, you know, adds to the difficulty. So hopefully I've given you an idea of sort of what we do with uh, our technology, structured life of mammography, and, you know, some of the challenges we face. And I just would like to thank my friend and colleague, Dr. Richard Lars, uh, because I've used some of the slides here. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take your questions. Okay. Uh, is SLP able to detect early stage of, stages of asthma? I think that's a very, very good question. Um, essentially, we so we, we have a study, and this is published. If you go onto a website, our website, Numica, you can actually see the on the publication section. We have a publication on asthma. And this is uh, children, I think, 7 to 16, who have undergone bronchodilation, so basically the inhaler that they take. And we've shown that with SLP, you can actually see some differences between healthy and asthmatics, and you can actually see a difference between kind of breathing parameters before and after bronchodilator. So potentially, we can actually differentiate the two cohorts. However, early detection is, is a different story. So that, again, goes back to further research, and we need more data to be able to prove, prove that. It's, it's a very good point because we've uh, been talking not 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 on asthma but on COPD, which is uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, like a smoker's disease. And apparently, if you can detect COPD early, you will save the national health system something about fifty to five hundred thousand pounds per patient during their lifetime. So it's actually a crucially important point, and that's something which I think we will be sort of moving towards slowly to sort of get more data and be able to show. Very good question. That's, that's also a good question. Um, I don't think we've actually looked at sort of whether that checkerboard is the best um, best pattern you can go for. And what I would say, or having you know looked at other devices and like the OED, it, it might be uh, sensible to actually look at look, look into placing physiological markers. So instead of going for a checkerboard which has got many points which is in a very nice because that gives you the higher resolution but if you have you know some of those points which are sort of uh, physiological markers on the body that, that just helps you a little bit further in in order to be able to estimate volume so no we haven't looked into optimizing the pattern but it works and as as it is we've been able to show some 
um, some preliminary clinical utility for the device. I'm going to call it a day and bid you farewell. Bye for now and happy. And thank you for having me. Cheers. Mm -hmm.